Hello to my 74 beautiful subscribers. I don't care about the rest of you. Go away. So dumb. So, in my last video, I was doing some testing on the Game Boy Player, um, and I found something that I really didn't expect. Uh, the DS, while playing Game Boy Advance games, had about an extra frame of input lag versus the original Game Boy Advance. Um, so naturally, I did what anyone would do. I went out and bought every single iteration of Nintendo handhelds which officially plays GBA games. Right now I'm focusing only on handhelds, and only official handhelds, none of your Chinese knockoffs. Though, I might explore some other TV output methods in the future. Right now the only consoles I'm testing are... Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Advance SP, Game Boy Advance SP Model AGS 101, Game Boy Advance SP with an IPS backlight mod, Game Boy Micro, Nintendo DS Lite, Nintendo DS Fat, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Pocket, and new Nintendo 2DS XL to test the 3DS Virtual Console. So without wasting too much of your time, I'm just going to jump right into the numbers and show you some of my findings. So, as we'd expect, the original Advance, SP, AGS 101, and Micro are all basically tied for input lag. Consistent with my previous findings, both models of DS introduce around one extra frame of lag. More interestingly, the 3DS Virtual Console, which I tested with a new 2DS XL, added only the same one frame as the DS systems. I was pretty surprised by this since I figured it was using software emulation to run GBA, but this isn't entirely true as we'll get to in a little bit. The IPS modded system was just a major disappointment. The added lag was definitely enough to feel the difference. This is what I've seen referred to as a V2 backlight mod, uh, but I'm sure there are many variations and many different versions that will be released in the future, so take this result as kind of the average generic IPS replacement screen. Moving over to Game Boy games. I tested the same Game Boy game with both an original Game Boy Pocket and a Game Boy Color, and the lag was identical. Playing the same game on a Game Boy Advance, however, it turns out the DS isn't the only system that introduces extra lag with backwards compatibility. As we saw with the DS on GBA games, it added about one extra frame of input lag. It seems that though these consoles have hardware to play these games pretty much natively, they're buffering a frame before sending it to the higher resolution display. This has honestly intrigued me enough that I'm thinking of doing a full comprehensive lag test of all backwards compatible game consoles and handhelds. Probably starting with just Nintendo systems though. Moving over to the Game Boy Virtual Console on 2DS, I was a bit less impressed than I was with how the 2DS handled GBA games. Unlike GBA, this is full software emulation. It's still a decent experience overall though, not game breaking. So if you're just here for the lag numbers, you can go I guess. Um, bye. But while I'm already in debt, I figured I'd run a few other tests on these systems, and I found a few things that at least I thought were pretty interesting. First though, I just want to go over something that you'll probably run into with a lot of these old used screens, and it's this flickering, almost interlacing artifact. Luckily, this can usually be fixed pretty easily using a potentiometer that basically all Game Boy models have. The easiest way I got rid of it was by getting a cheap flash cart and using an AGS aging cartridge ROM. This has a really useful pattern that makes it really easy to see the flickering so you can minimize it as much as possible. Just note that if you want to do this with a GBA SP, you need to plug in the game and power adapter, turn it on and wait to get into the game, then remove the battery so you can access the potentiometer. This basically changes the amount of voltage that goes to the screen, so just be a bit careful. If you go too fast, you could damage something. Now, onto the actual comparison. I'll start with a baseline Game Boy Advance. Yeah, this screen sucks. The colors are dull, so much so that the developers designed their games with bright and oversaturated colors to try to make up for it. Brightness is, well, non-existent. You need to be in a very well-lit environment or have one of these little doohickeys if you want any chance of seeing what you're playing. This screen does have one strength though, and that's response time. So many people conflate response time and input lag, but response time actually refers to pixel response. It's essentially the speed at which individual pixels can change their colors. This is hard for me to measure objectively with the tools I have, so I'll just show recordings of each screen to get an idea of how bad the blur is. So for this screen, you only really see colors from the previous frame disappearing, not from multiple previous frames as we'll see in a minute. Next we have the GBA SP, and this has much of the same story except that the screen has a built-in front light, which makes it significantly easier to use indoors. Unfortunately, this front light casts a bit of a blue tint and can actually cause a bit of image doubling in some units. Response time is also good, basically the same as the original GBA. Moving to the holy grail of GBA systems, the AGS-101 model. This just looks so much better. It's an actual proper backlit LCD, and the colors are so much more vibrant. And rather than an on-off button for the light, it goes from brighter than the original SP to way brighter than the original SP. It's not all sunshine and rainbows though, as there are a few issues with this screen. 
One is that it has noticeable ghosting due to a much slower response time than previous screens. You can see in these shots that several previous frames blur into the current frame. This is still much better than ghosting on the Game Boy Pocket, not to mention the original Game Boy. The screen also could be described as a bit too vibrant. This is mainly due to, as previously mentioned, games that were designed with the crappy screens in mind. But as I'll show with the Game Boy Micro, the color palette looks a bit more off than it really needs to be. Speaking of the Game Boy Micro, moving on to the smallest screen here. And just like the AGS 101, the screen looks great. It has more brightness controls, though the highest brightness settings appear to be about the same as the AGS 101. This model, unfortunately, does still suffer from ghosting. It actually looks fairly similar to the AGS 101, though I'd say it's slightly less noticeable. One positive thing I can say about the screen, though, is that the color palette does seem to more closely match that of the original screens, so the oversaturated colors look a bit more like they were supposed to on the dull screens they were developed for. Next on the chopping block is the IPS mod, and boy, I really wanted to like this one. The colors look fantastic. The resolution of the screen makes everything look just so sharp. It gets much brighter than every official screen, and it even has pretty good response times. If you want something that just looks nice, this might be exactly what you're looking for. The very sharp, pixelated, almost emulated look may not be for everyone, but I'm sure a lot of people would love it. Unfortunately, there are just too many other problems for me to use it as my primary Game Boy. There is a previously stated input lag, though that wouldn't be game-breaking for most games. But there's also a consistent jitter with the movement. It's subtle, but it can get a bit annoying when scrolling smoothly. I believe it's a result of the LCD panel running at a different refresh rate from the original screen, in addition to some buffering to prevent screen tearing and to scale the image properly. The screen overall does just look so good, but I can't get past those glaring issues. Moving down to our first DS, and it actually looks pretty good. Uh, the screen doesn't get super bright, and the colors are not very vibrant, but it does look a bit better than the original SP's screen, and the colors don't look inaccurate. Response time lands somewhere between the original GBA and the AGS 101, but overall it's not too noticeable. Next is the DS Lite. The screen is overall very similar to the AGS 101 screen. Really vibrant colors, much better brightness than the Fat DS, but unfortunately the response times are also pretty similar to the AGS 101, showing a somewhat noticeable amount of ghosting. The color palette also does seem a bit closer to the AGS 101 than it does to the Fat DS or the Micro. Now for the 2DS XL. This result may vary by model, especially if you're one of the lucky butts who managed to get an IPS screen on your new 3DS, as the vast majority of units have TN panels which have inferior colors and viewing angles. Also know that you'll have to install custom firmware if you're not one of the other lucky butts who bought a 3DS for its original retail price back in 2011. It's actually pretty interesting how it runs these games, as they're not completely emulated. The 3DS does have to emulate some GBA hardware, but it's downclocking its CPU to run GBA games in much the same way the original DS does. So that explains why it has much lower input lag than the fully software emulated Game Boy Color Virtual Console. This also means that compatibility is excellent with ROM injection if you have custom firmware installed. For the screen itself, at first I thought it was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, the blur actually looks a bit worse than the AGS 101, which I was not expecting. However, this actually seems to be deliberate frame blending. I'm not sure exactly why Nintendo did this, possibly to protect the screen from flickering objects that were standard for transparency effects in Game Boy games, such as the map in F-Zero. But if you're injecting your own GBA games, you can actually turn the blur off with a single click. This makes me wonder whether the AGS 101 screen also has some deliberate frame blending, but it's not something that I have the tools to differentiate from just bad response time. Once the blur is removed, the response time is actually really good. Colors are also pretty good, as you might expect. The scaling is a bit blurry as it's not an integer scale and it doesn't look amazing. Though you can actually activate a pixel perfect mode by holding select as you boot the game. Though this makes the picture really too tiny to play enjoyably. I actually went ahead and tested to see whether the 3DS Virtual Console clocks at the exact same speed as the original Game Boy. And I did the same thing with the DS for the sake of completeness. And I discovered something else that I've never really seen mentioned. I measured both the DS and 2DS to be about 0.12% slower than the GBA systems, which is about a second difference every 14 minutes. It may not seem like a lot, but that's a huge difference when it comes to speedrunning. I looked around a bit and found GBA tech, which is a huge amount of technical documentation. And it turns out that the DS's NDS7 coprocessor, which is what's used in GBA mode, is actually the same chip as the GBA's main processor. In DS mode, it normally runs at this speed, and in GBA mode, it's speculated that its clock is cut in half to run at this speed, slightly lower than the GBA's clock. Turns out it was already speculated right here that the DS runs GBA games slightly slower. 
And if you compare those numbers, then wouldn't you know it, you get the same 0.12% difference that I measured. So that all checks out. Since the 2DS and DS Lite didn't drift at all from each other, I'm going to assume that the GBA mode runs at the same clock speeds for both DS and 3DS systems. I ran the same test between Game Boy Pocket, Color, and Advance, and they didn't differ by a single frame over the course of 9 minutes. So I'm going to say the GBA runs original GB games at the correct speed. So when it comes down to it, at least for me, uh, the best way to play GBA games is still going to be the AGS 101. Um, see, I originally grew up with one of these old SPs, and when I first picked up a backlight model, the ghosting was a bit of a deal breaker for me. But as I got more used to it, and I've played other systems with similar problems, it's really become more of a non-issue. I've put up with a lot more ghosting on my PSP, for example. The overly vibrant colors, if you could call them that, are really just a taste thing. Whether or not they fully represent the game designer's original vision. An honorable mention goes to the Game Boy Micro. The pixel density is great, the buttons are great, and if you have small hands and can get past the screen size, especially if you really only plan to use it in short amounts, the Micro is still really good and has more accurate colors in my humble opinion. So now for Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, uh, the only real options are between the Game Boy Color and the AGS 101. Um, and despite the extra frame of lag, I really like being able to see what I'm doing, so I'm always going to reach for the SP again. Um, maybe if somebody makes a mod in the future for an IPS backlight mod that doesn't add any extra lag for the Game Boy Color, um, I might go for that, but until then I'm always just going to reach for this. And while I think this is still the best way to play Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games on the go, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to play them, period. Um, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on some Game Boy Consoleizer kits and some other things to see if we can get some video output that has lower lag than the Game Boy interface. So, on that note, um, I have a few other videos in the works. Uh, the first and easiest that I'm going to put out is probably going to be just a general input lag test of backwards compatibility on Nintendo consoles. Um, I don't really want to become known as the uh, input lag channel, but, I mean, it's just something that there seems to be an extreme lack of information on. But, that'll be it for me, and uh, hopefully I'll catch you in the next one. Oh, this was a terrible mistake. <laughs>